Everyone is calling OneMove the most controllable image to video model released so far. Point level motion, camera control, cinematic movement from a single frame. But today isn't a demo, it's an audit. In this video, I'm stress testing the WAN 2.1 image to video 14 billion parameter model, specifically the move variant, to find out what's real, what breaks and where the limits actually are. We're not doing best case prompts, we're doing adversarial tests. Test 1. Can we fix anatomy by pinning joints? Zero length vectors and force correction motion at the skeletal level. Test 2. What happens when the text prompts directly contradicts the motion trajectory? And test 3. Can we fake a Hitchcock dolly zoom by driving opposing foreground and background splines without camera hacks? Then I'm benchmarking all this against the time to move, a training free inference time motion system to answer one simple question. Is one move actually more stable? No hype, no cherry picked clips, all the failures stay in. If you care about how these models actually work, not how they're marketed, this video is for you. Astro will break down the architecture, I'll break down the model. Let's get to it. Hello. Today we are examining one move, specifically the 14 billion parameter image to video model from the WAN 2.1 family. This model distinguishes itself through its architecture. It utilizes a hybrid system combining a diffusion transformer, or DIT, with a specialized 3D causal variational autoencoder. This causal VAE is critical. It compresses video data efficiently while strictly preserving temporal continuity, ensuring that motion flows logically from past frames to future ones without looking ahead and creating artifacts. The move designation refers to this model's fine-tuning for precise point-level motion control, achieving state-of-the-art results in dynamic scene generation. While the native resolution is 480p, the coherence is high enough that it upscales effectively to 720p or 1080p using standard workflows. Now for the implementation. We are using Kijai's WAN Video Wrapper, which streamlines the loading process in Comfy UI. For the downloads, you have two primary paths, if you are running a high VRAM setup, like an RTX 4090 or 5090, use the FP16 or BF15 diffusion model linked in the description. This preserves the full dynamic range of the motion weights. For most users, the FP8 scaled version is the efficient choice. It significantly reduces VRAM usage with negligible quality loss. You will also need three auxiliary files. First, the UMT5 XXL text encoder. Second, the proprietary WAN 2.1 VAE, and third, the Clip Vision H model, which is essential for the image to video conditioning. Place these in the respective folders as shown in the notes. Ensure your Comfy UI is on the latest nightly build to support the native node structures required by the wrapper. That is the technical overview. Back to you, Manny. So this workflow that I've adapted from Kijai's is available on my Patreon. It is available for free. And while you're there, you'll find lots of other free resources, including the time to move workflow. I have other paid Patreon plans where you can grab lots of other resources that I'm continually updating. And I just want to take this moment to thank my Patreon supporters and to let you guys know that there'll be plenty more coming soon, such as some Comfy UI courses that will be exclusively just for the Patreons. So once you've downloaded the workflow, drop it onto the canvas. I've created a notes box on the left hand side where you can download all the models from. So take a look and make sure your models are placed in the correct folders and selected in your model loaders. Guys with lower VRAM can swap these out for GGUF loader nodes and use the GGUF models. Otherwise, most people will be able to use the FP8 version. I'll be using the FP16 full precision and we will be performing a series of tests. Now, before we jump into the tests, the first thing that you've got to learn about this model is this spline editor. Everything in one move lives or dies by this panel. This isn't animation. This is constraint design. But what's important is you need to know how to use it. These motion tracks you create are called splines and you can create multiple splines. So I figured all this out so you don't have to. So if you listen carefully, you will know how to do all of this without going through all the headaches. So click and drag to create a motion path. Hold shift and click to add a point to an end of an existing path. Control and click to subdivide and add a point in the middle of a path. Right click deletes a point. When I first jumped in, I started messing about without knowing all of this and it took me a while to figure out why the model was behaving badly. We'll get into multiple splines in a bit, but let's first do a generation. 
So this was the first generation I'd done in Kijai's workflow. Before I tidied it up and adapted it, we'll take this simple image of a woman and the motion trajectory is just to move her chin around and from the first simple generation, it was a roaring success. But this is a simple motion and as you will see later, the complexity does break this model. But just from this generation, this type of motion is very, very difficult to achieve in other models. So this is already ticking boxes that others have failed on. So here was another motion trajectory for a face that I'd done a bit later on. This was a very similar kind of motion. And here is the generation. And as you can see, the model has absolutely no problems there apart from the fact that a man appears that wasn't in the prompt. So those are two simple motion trajectories for the face that you can control quite easily. Now let's try some more complex motions. So here I load up this image of this girl. And again, what I'm after is this head movement. We're going to keep it simple for now. We're going to use a single spline and we want her to just move her head, snake it down towards the ground in a kind of dance style. And the prompt here is the girl moves her head around as she performs a snake-like dance movement with her body. So I'm using the FP16 model and clip and I've got a 1280p by 720 generation. I'm just going to change the Chinese negative prompt to an English one so I know what it says. Because my Chinese is not that great, you know. And let's run the workflow. So the generation, let's start there, took 332 seconds which is just over five minutes, but it was for a total of 121 frames at 1280 by 720 resolution. This is the generation what it produced. Now, as you can see, something's gone terribly wrong here. The motion is there. We've got the motion, but there's some ghosting. The motion is not as natural. The control is causing it some problems. So I'll just change the prompt a bit and I'll rerun the workflow. So I'll add she is squatting. But here is what the second one produced and it's actually gone completely wrong. So this test really failed to produce the right outcome. It's completely missed the head and it's using the background for the trajectory motion. And the hands have been terrible on both these generations. But let's move on to something else. So here I'm going to load up this image of this beautiful happy woman with her hand in the air. So I run and immediately cancel to load this up into the spline editor. You have to make sure that you've already set your generation size because if it changes afterward, it will mess up the whole spline editor. The positionings of your spines will end up all over the place. So here I'm going to set up the splines for this lasso motion. So I want the girl to mimic a lasso in the air. So once I've set up my spline, I will have to write a prompt. And the prompt is, the young woman moves her hand as though she is spinning up a lasso. So from the splines, I think you get the idea. What we're hoping for is that she spins her hand in the air like a lasso. So we run the prompt and what we end up with is this. And this is obviously not what we intended. And there's so many things wrong with this generation. I'll let you guys be the judge. You can see what's going on here. I won't retry this. Let's just move on to the next test. So here I'm loading up an image of this girl and she's using her fingers to indicate something. So come on lads, I'm sure it's bigger than that. Let's see what we can get her to do. So using the spline editor, let's create the edits. So by right clicking on the spline editor, you can add a new spline. Now, none of these splines take precedent over one another. It will try to generate all of them with the same priority level. Each spline you draw is a separate motion instruction. The model sees all of them at the same time. There is no order, no layer stack, no priorities. If you draw it, the model will try to obey it. Now there are ways to set priority and strength using density of points and spatial overlap, but we're not going to get into that here. There is no foreground or background priority unless you create it. And if splines contradict, the model doesn't choose one, it tries to satisfy both. And that's what results in stretching and warping. Okay, so the prompt here reads, a video of a young woman who opens her fingers apart, indicating larger, and then closes them together until they touch. Her expression remains the same. Let's cue the prompt and that run resulted in this generation and there's a bit of ghosting but I feel the model done okay here. So it's managed to take our instructions and create the motion that we wanted. Let's move on to the next test. So for the next test we're going to load up this image of this dancer and similarly here I'm going to use two splines but this time is to indicate two different limb movements. 
So again, I'm going to set the resolution and then run and cancel. And so let's set up the spline so her right hand comes down and her left hand goes up. But I will do one extra thing here. So I'm going to add a vector, a third spline, but this is a zero vector. So I'm going to place it on her hip and that shouldn't move. And I will also create a prompt to reflect that. And let's cue prompt. And here is the generation from that attempt. And in this case, I think the model is done okay. It's created quite realistic look in motion. It's followed our instructions. So the right hand goes down and the left hand comes up and the hip is stationary. I think it's full marks for this generation. So next we load up this image of this woman. She's holding a hat and I think you get the gist of it. I want her to raise the hat and wave frantically. I've placed a zero vector on her other hand and head. So I want that to stay stationary. So I put all that in the prompt. Now let's run it and see what we get. And here's the outcome. And I think the model, it's done quite well here. And if you've been noticing the trajectory motion tracks appearing in the final generation, that's because of this one video draw one move tracks node. They can just delete this node and those won't appear, but we'll use it here for testing so you can see what's happening. So before we move on to the camera simulation test that I want to show you, let me just show you this other generation I just done. So I've loaded up this image of this girl doing a Kung Fu kick and you can see the intentions from the spline editor. And here again, the model performed quite well. It produced the exact motion that I wanted. Well, almost, but it was good enough. These would be very difficult motions to try to get a model to produce, but here you can define it quite well using the spline editor. So next we want to look at a few camera simulations. So the first thing to know here is that there is no camera. So every camera move you think you're making is a lie. A pan is just the background moving. A zoom is just space expanding or collapsing. And if you want a dolly zoom look, you move the foreground and background in opposite directions. Let's test a couple of these camera movements. So here I load up this image of this car. And for the first test, we want to zoom out. Now to zoom out, the vector must point inwards. So in other words, the point in the picture moves inwards as the camera zooms out. I've written the prompt to reflect that and let's do the prompt. And here's what we get from that generation. And one thing to notice is the zoom does work, but the vehicle seems to be moving. Now we didn't put anything in the prompt and honestly, every prompt could be better, but I'll still give this a pass. The model has understood what needs to happen. So we'll continue using this same image and we'll try some different camera movements. So this time I'll place a vector from left to right and prompt for a pan around the car. The prompt is the camera pans around the car as it remains stationary. Let's cue the prompt and notice both these vectors that I used are completely straight. I haven't used any angles or curves, but here's what the pan produced. So as you can see, it's doing what the spline editor was indicating, but it's completely ignored the prompt for the car to remain stationary. So what I'm finding is that this model is a bit hit and miss. Your splines have to be defined well and your prompt has to be on point. I will run this one more time just with a stronger prompt to see if we can stop the car from moving. So I've added something to the prompt. It says the car should not move and remain at rest while the camera pans around the car, showing it from a different angle. So let's run that and see the prompt adherence of this model. And so here is the generation. And as you can see, it's not listening to a word I'm saying. I might as well be talking to a brick wall. So why aren't you using a zero vector? You're probably shouting. So let's do that. I will place two zero vectors on the vehicle itself. I have placed two here. One has disappeared for some reason, but it's there. Let's run the model with the same prompt, but this time with a zero vector in place. And here's what we get. And I was kind of expecting this, to be honest. So the vehicle remains stationary in the center. The entire scene is moving. So creating the motion of the car sliding across the surface. So for this type of motion, I have better workflows. I have a Uni 3C workflow for my Patreons. That's in the paid tiers. And that workflow can do something like this. So if you want that workflow, that is on my Patreon too. So for the last test for this model, I want to show you the dolly zoom effect. Now, this is where we use opposing direction spines in the foreground and the background to try to create an effect like a dolly zoom. So here I load up this image of this person in the mountains. And I'm going to set up the splines. Now I'm going to use several splines for this because I find this works best. And so these splines will be angled radially outwards towards the corners. 
and I'll also to create two at the top readily inwards towards the center. And the character and the mid-ground, I will place zero vector splines. I don't know why they disappeared, but they are there. And frankly, I'm going to just ignore the prompt. I'm just leaving the prompt as it was. Still with the car and the camera motion. With all these constraints, I don't think it can do anything with the prompt. Let's run the workflow and see what we get. And this is the great thing about this model, that you can do stuff like this. Because this is an absolutely amazing shot and a dolly zoom effect created just from these constraints. I will let you guys be the judge of this one. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. So where does that leave WAN move? So it's not a magic bullet. Prompt adherence is weaker than some newer video models and you will get odd generations if you over constrain or rely on language alone. But that's not what this model is for. WAN move isn't a prompt first system. It's a control first system. When you treat trajectories as optional decoration, results are inconsistent. When you treat them as constraints, the model becomes predictable. This isn't a replacement for prompt driven video models. It's a different instrument. Use it when you need determinism, when you need repeatable motion, when you need something to stay still or move in a way language can't describe. Used correctly, one move earns its place. Used blindly, it will fight you. Like most serious tools in AI right now, the power isn't in the model. It's knowing its limits and knowing when to reach for something else. That's the audit. Now let's move over to the time to move workflow. As promised before, I was going to come back to this one. So let's take a look at this and see what it can do. This is also on my Patreon. This one's free and all model download links are in the notes box. So remember this one requires a mask and it requires a motion tracking video that you need to create. So the developers do offer a cut and drag app that you can run on your machine using some Python code. I first ran it, I got some errors. I had to go in and start editing some of the code and I don't expect any of you to do that, but I got it running eventually. I also made rudimentary masks in DaVinci just to try it out, which wasn't easy. But I've seen others using this model and they produce some nice work. But for me, it's too finicky. There's too many issues creating a mask and a motion video. It's all a bit much and it's not in the comfy UI environment. But here's the mask I produced and here's the final output. And obviously it's a failure after all my work. Once I did get the cut and drag app running, I did try it again, but that one ended up a mess too. The bottom line with this model after testing it and messing about with it for a while is it's just a lot of bother for not a lot of return. Now, if you guys can be asked to create your motion video and create your masks, whether it's in the cut and drag app or whether it's in DaVinci or a different editor and then bring it in here into Comfy to create your final piece. All well and good. I mean, it's a bit too much for me. I'm looking for a simpler solution, something that uses seg masking within Comfy. But the workflow is there for you guys if anybody wants to try it and use it. But I'm moving on looking for a new better solution. And that brings me to another workflow that I need to mention. It's on my Patreon. It's in my pay tier. And I'm not trying to plug this. I'm just trying to show you the difference between this and something like the time to move. Complexities of the time to move where you need to create masks and everything. Here I'm just going to use a prompt. And this is a high motion workflow using clown sharks samplers and it's a triple pass. I'm not going to get too into it, but here's the prompt. And all I'm using here is an input image and a prompt. So it's just basically an image to video workflow. And here's the output it produced. And if I change the prompt, I could probably get it to do the full spin around. But it's just to show you that, you know, all the cut and drag app and it's kind of unnecessary and a bit tedious in this day and age. Anyway, guys, I hope this has been an interesting video and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the stuff that you guys are doing. So please share your stuff on Discord and let me know if you'd like me to use any of it in my videos because I'd like to show some of your work. I'm currently messing with the SVI stuff because Stable Video Infinity is to me one of the better projects and I'm liking what's coming from there. Hopefully I'll put up some new workflows for that. So if you made it this far, thank you for watching and please smash the like button, hit the subscribe and hit the notification bell to get the videos as soon as they land. I hope you have a wonderful day. See you in the next one. Another workflow. Another set of secrets unlocked. Stay curious.